All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning. Lord, receive our worship and our praise. Lord, we come in with joy in our hearts. Lord, even though there's been some tragedy this week, and certainly, Lord, we're remembering uh, those that have lost loved one. Uh, we're remembering Doug this morning. Father, we carry on in joy because we know that you are watching over and that you have all of us in your hands, in the palm of your hands, Lord. Father, uh, so receive our praise today as we lift you up and we have joy in your presence, Lord. I just pray that your presence will be here today and that you would uh, just give us a conscious awareness of your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
All right. Next three, this is what we've, everybody should, most everybody should be familiar with this. We've been doing some of these for a couple weeks now, so everybody sing along. Sorry. <laughs> Rachel's making me forget that capo now. Sorry about that, please. <laughs>
glorify you. We uplift your name, Lord. Bless this service. Bless all of us who are here uh, today, Lord, and those that will uh, hear by uh, uh, video and can't be with us today, Lord. Father, we just pray your blessings on this service. Open our hearts and our minds to receive today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to lead us into our sermon with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus once again. Father, we are presenting ourselves to you. And Father, we want to live our lives in a way that is pleasing to you, Father, to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And Lord, as, uh, as a part of that, Lord, uh, Lord, we want to walk humbly before you. So Father, today as we go into your word, um, we just ask that you would uh, open our hearts and our minds to receive. And what we hear, let it take hold. And Father, help us to mix the words that we hear with faith that it would profit and do a benefit to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we are in a sermon series that I'm calling My People. And this is part two of a sermon that started last week, that God's people are humble. And last week the primary focus was just to lay the groundwork that being humble is the opposite of having pride. And, and you remember there's different kinds of pride. Like if you take pride in your kids or something, that's not the kind of pride that God doesn't like. He likes the pride where there is excessive self-esteem. We're supposed to feel good about ourselves, but if we feel so good about ourselves that we think that we are the greatest thing and everybody else is, you know, no good, then there's a problem. That's a problem. And God hates pride. Everybody say, God hates pride. God hates pride. And so, to walk humbly before Him is what we should strive to do, and this is what we're going to uh, look at today. Um, so I've got a couple of scriptures to read. Who would like to read today? Okay, all right. So we got our uh, opening scriptures, Romans 12, 3 through 5. Why don't you jump in there and read that from uh, New Revised Standard Version today. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, for we are one body in Christ. What you think of yourself is up here. And nobody can see into your mind or see what's in your heart, but God knows. The devil cannot read your mind. Some people like to think so. But when you have thoughts in your mind, they are your own thoughts and they're nobody else's business. People in this country, treasure the ability to have the freedom to think and believe what we want to believe. And, and uh, I celebrate the freedoms that we have. And it's very bad when the government or somebody else tries to tell you what to think and what to believe. I am from an old school way of thinking where when I turn on my 6 o'clock news or however I get my news, the internet or whatever, I just want people to tell me the facts of what's going on, and then I get to decide and make up my own mind about things. I don't really appreciate this, this new age of information dissemination where they say, oh, we're not going to tell you something because that's a lie. Well, you know what? That's for me to make up my mind about that. Just tell me the facts, and I'll make up my own mind. The best way I figured out how to make up my own mind about things is to listen to one viewpoint and then listen to another viewpoint and then probably the truth is somewhere in between but I get to decide that for myself you get to decide that for yourself and that's one of the things that we treasure but what you have in your mind nobody can look at you and look into your mind and say I know what you're thinking when they start doing that we start stepping over some boundaries that aren't good and, and a good lesson to learn from ourselves is when somebody is going through something that appears to be very tragic, big mistake, everybody has to learn it. I had to learn it the hard way. 
the wrong words to say is, I, I know what you're going through. I know how you feel. Because even if you've gone through something similar, you really don't know how someone feels. You really don't know what kind of stress they're under. And that's a hard thing. It's, it's a hard thing to learn, but it's a good thing to say, you know, I don't, I don't know how you feel, but I'm concerned about you. I may have had a similar experience that helps me to empathize, but, you know, I don't know how you feel. Please share with me and tell me. That's a hard thing to learn, but I, I've tried to train myself over the years to be a little more sensitive. Um, times of loss, like with funeral, um, is one of those times when it's good to remember those things and be careful with what we say. But what we have in our mind is something that only you know and only it's just between you and God. And so in that mind of ours, our hidden thoughts, our, our secret way of, of looking at the world that's just our own and nobody else's, what goes on in there matters to the Lord. And we fight a battle of the mind. Some of us have a greater challenge with that. With some people, a battle of the mind is is the most difficult thing that we face. Sometimes it's the battle of the flesh, and sometimes it's the battle of the heart. There's three arenas there where the devil likes to attack us. But what matters, what, what goes on in our mind matters to the Lord. And if we have an attitude that I am not just good, I'm real good. I'm the best thing that God ever made. I'm God's gift to the world. We really, we really puff ourselves up there a little bit. And those kind of things matter. Because you might think that you've got those things all locked away, but you know eventually they're going to work their, their way to the surface. Nobody can look at our mind, but when we think something long enough, it's going to come out of us. And we should not think too highly of ourselves because eventually that's going to work its way to the surface, and that comes across as being haughty being a person with a bad attitude, someone that, you know, others don't really enjoy being around because it's like, I know in our family, Sheila's, that's one of pet peeves is people that think they're better than everybody else. And I have to agree with her. I don't, I don't enjoy being around people that have that thought. I just want to be at a same level playing field with others. But what is in that mind is your thoughts. But if you don't put a rein on it and you don't, bring that into control and into balance, then it will start to come out with, you know, it'll start showing on your face when you start looking down your nose at other people. If you've, if you've seen people do that, you know, that means it's a visual indication that what's going on in the mind is now starting to come out, and then you can start to see it on the face. Luke 6.45, that process of coming out. What's the next reader? Luke 6.45. Go ahead, Stacy. there. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So these secrets that are within us, those private thoughts, the meditations of our heart, they don't stay a secret. They will come out and they'll begin to show themselves. And if what you are thinking up here is thinking too highly of yourself, that is that excessive self-esteem that we talked about last week. That is basically the definition of what pride is. God hates a proud look. And when those prideful thoughts and the meditations of our heart, when we think that they, when we begin to think of ourselves too highly, they will come out as pride. So this is something that we got to rein in and keep it in control. And what's a good example of that? I thought I would include one good example of that. Um, Matthew uh, chapter 5, 33, start with verse 33. This is New Century uh, version. Would you like to go ahead and read that there? You have heard that it was said to our people long ago, don't break your promises, but keep the promises you make to the Lord. But I tell you, never swear an oath. Don't swear an oath using the name of heaven, because heaven is God's throne. 
Don't swear an oath using the name of the earth, because the earth belongs to God. Don't swear an oath using the name of Jerusalem, because that is the city of the great king. Don't even swear by your own head, because you cannot make one hair on your head become white or black. Say only yes if you mean yes, and no if you mean no. If you say more than yes or no, it is from the evil one. So here's, a, here's one example of how something that's in the mind can start to come out, and that's oaths. So imagine, if you will, for some that's not a difficult imagination, you have kids that are approaching driving age, let's say, and they say, Mom or Dad, I want to have a certain vehicle to drive, or I, I'm, I want something you know, cool to drive, I want something that's going to make me look pretty good or whatever. And of course, as parents, we want to help our kids to, to get what they need and get what they want, and that's... That's uh, part of the job description, I suppose. Train them up and but help them along. And so, if you just say, "Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do my best. We'll see what we can we'll see what we can come up with," that would be an appropriate type of a response. A yes means yes, and a no means no. Maybe the answer is uh, no. In our household, we believe it. You know, we believe in teaching you to work hard for what you get, and so, you know, we'll help you get a job so you can buy that car. Whatever works in your family, that works good. Yes means yes, no means no. All right, now, uh, maybe maybe all would be interested to know, my parents asked me this, and but I was thinking, Travis, would you like to have a computer or a car? So, being the nerd that I am, I said, as long as you'll drive me where I want to go, I want that computer. <laughs> And, uh, of course, that became my career, so it was probably a good choice. But I also like playing the video games, too. So it was great. It was a great choice for me. I didn't mind. So, and it also, back in those days, it was cheaper to buy a car than it was a computer. So it was the right financial decision, too. But whatever. Anyways. Oh, um, but whatever, whatever works is good. But the, uh, 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 a response to that situation where it comes out of pride would be to say, son or daughter, you are my son and you deserve the best and I guarantee you, I swear by your great grandmother's uh, grave or whatever, I swear to you that you will have a Ferrari by the time you are 16, whatever. Pick your, pick your hot rod or whatever. Son, we are just, or daughter, you're going to have the best. And I swear to you that I will get that for you. Now, that's, that seems like a different kind of an answer, and it is, because when you put out an answer like that and you swear an oath that you're going to do something, the implication is that it's you that's doing it. That you have the power, that you have the means, that you have the intestinal fortitude, that you can accomplish anything you want, whatever you say, it's going to happen. But we do not know from moment to moment where our lives go. The Bible tells us that our lives are like a vapor. And when that vapor is released, it might fill the room with a great scent, but all you have to do is open a window and vapors have a tendency to blow away. And our lives are like that. Our lives are fleeting. And one never knows if we're going to have life in our lungs tomorrow because that is not promised to us. We may not be around. Maybe you got a year or two for this young person to start driving and maybe mom or dad who ever made the promise won't have a job that year. Or maybe they, you know, have financial difficulties and it's not possible. Or maybe health reasons prevent them from fulfilling that promise. We don't, we think we've got control, but really, God's in control. We learned last week that where our position and our place in this world is really determined by other people. So, it would be awful to make a swear an oath like that and then the next day, gee, the boss comes in and said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. You know, all of a sudden, situations change, and we really don't have the means to make oaths like that. So that oaths is something that derives from pride. When we make an oath that we will do something, you know, come hell or high water, 
we really can't make good on that. We can't guarantee that. We may have the best of intentions, but we're really not in a position to make that. So scripture tells us, say only yes if you mean yes and no if you mean no. If you say more than yes or no, then that is from the evil one. And that is because that is pride coming through. If you believe it in your mind, oh yeah, I'm, I, I can do this and there's nothing that can stop me because I am so good at my job and I'm so, you know, we've, we've got the plan, nothing can derail that and you're just fooling yourself. We fool ourselves if we think we're doing it. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So we need to give up credit to the Lord for what we do. And I give the credit to the Lord that, you know, actually I did get that vehicle. I was playing on a computer, but I used my computer knowledge and did some wheeling and dealing and built computers and I learned what I need to do. And that's actually how I got my first vehicle. My first vehicle was a 1964 Dodge pickup truck, and it was Flint, Fred Flintstone style. You know what I mean by that? That means I could stick my foot on the ground and do this, because there was no floorboard. <laughs> so I had to put a board down at the bottom. That was my floor. And I, but I got all working and everything. $500 for that vehicle. Borrowed $200 and 50 $250 for my brother and $250 for my mother. Went out and got a job, paid that thing off. I tell you what, that's one of my proudest moments, not to talk about pride, but that was joy in the accomplishment. I feel good that, that I did that. So that was a good life lesson too. But oaths, if I had said, oh yeah, I can go out and get my own vehicle, that would have been from prideful. But I worked hard, and then in the end I said, well, thank God for what I have. And I still to this day thank God for everything that he chooses to send my way. And it's God that provides it. So that is an example of pride in the answer and how pride in the mind and in the heart can come out in our language and in our oaths. Acts 23, 11 to 12, also from New Century Version, Apostle Paul was taken into custody in Jerusalem, and this is, this is the point in his... In his life, when from this point on he remained in custody and he was uh, extradited to Rome and, and was standing trial for false charges that the, that the, uh, the Jewish Sanhedrin court had charged him with false charges. But during his imprisonment and, and, and the time that he was uh, writing the Gospels and everything, giving the testimonies that God sent him through, there was a point where... He was in the crosshairs of the Jewish leadership. Verse 11 says, The next night the Lord came and stood by Paul and he said, Be brave. You have told people in Jerusalem about me and you must do the same in Rome. In the morning, some evil people made a plan to kill Paul and they took an oath not to eat or drink anything until they had killed him. I won't sleep until that car is in the driveway. All right? Same sort of thing. They made an oath they weren't going to eat or drink until, until they had killed Paul. Well, God sent him on his way and up the line. He was heading to Rome. And so, you know, I'll bet those guys that made that oath felt about that small when they had to go back. I'm hungry and he ain't dead yet. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what. Oaths will get you in trouble. So uh, if you follow along in the fill in the blank there, it says, what you think of yourself is in your blank. Mind. It's in your mind, hidden from other people. Number two, excessive self-esteem, which is blank, causes you to think highly of yourself. Right. That's right. your pride. Eventually, everything that is inside will find its way huh. out. And swearing an oath that you will do something is an outward expression of pride, you're saying that you don't need blank to accomplish it. You don't need God. You can do it on your own because you're so big. It's really a deception of the devil. But it leads to something else. It leads to, it leads to a pathway that the scripture in the Old Testament calls being a fool. If you don't get a handle and a rein on this thing, and you begin to think of yourself 
as I'm so big and so bad that I don't, I can do anything I set my mind to. I'm so big and bad. No, nothing can derail that. You're basically saying, I don't need God anymore. And this pride eventually puts you on a path to become, be, to become what the Bible calls a fool. I don't mean like a jester, like, Ugh, but someone who's prideful in their heart. And they're so lifted up in pride that they don't need anything from anybody anymore. That's a fool. And the first thing to learn about a fool, Psalm 14.1, is a fool has said in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they have done abominable works and there is none that doeth good. If we have this swelling of pride, this ex excessive self-esteem, this thinking too highly of ourselves, it's a poison that will lead us down the path to eventually to where we'll say, you know, I don't even, I don't even think God is around anymore. I, I, I'm my own God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that could mean simply, I don't need, I don't need God anymore because I've got what I need. Okay, so humble ourselves. To live a life of humility, we need to train ourselves to think in a humble manner. If we're going to live humbly before the Lord and please Him in our life, it really takes training. Because the mind wants to think of wrong things. The body naturally wants to do wrong things. And the heart wants to be lifted up and lift us up into pride. That's the nature of being a fallen man is all these forces pulling at us. The mind wanting to think wrong things, the body wanting to do wrong things, and the heart wanting to lift itself up in pride. So we've got to take control of that, and we've got to rein it in so that we don't get pulled down that path and begin to lead a life that's displeasing to the Lord. We want to do that by humbling ourselves. And if we train our mind to do to think of ourselves in a humble way. The nice thing about that is, just like pride can work its way out to the outside, humility will work its way to the outside. If we change what's on the inside, it will work its way to the surface. If we train our mind to think humbly and to walk humbly and to humble ourselves, then we will live and walk outwardly as a humble person. You don't have to walk around and say, hey, look at me, I'm humble. <laughs> Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, you know. <laughs> I'm humble. You, you know, that's just something you don't say. You don't, you don't claim humility. You just got to build it in the inside and let it come out of you. And, and it will. It will emerge all on its own. So that's the goal, is to train our mind to think humbly, to be humbly, to be humble, and to please God with, with a humble heart. So there's a lot of ways to do that. I, at the bottom, uh, on the inside left of your bulletin there, it's, uh, I've got a, I copied this. This is straight plagiarism here. 12 ways to humble yourself. I kind of browsed around and thought, well, what is other people's opinions on how to be humble? And I got a few, it was interesting, different answers from different resources. This is actually from Billy Graham's ministry, and I thought it was well written, and they had the scripture references and everything, so I'm just including this here. I got the website address if you want to go look that up. They've got a little explanation, got the scripture references there, you can look it up. But just to kind of, you know, to think about it, to train yourselves to be humble, um, Billy Graham's uh, uh, ministry there suggests, you know, routinely confess your sins to God. And that is a real good idea to remind ourselves that we haven't arrived. You know, we accepted the Lord in our heart. We accepted Him as our Savior. Some people think that's the end point, but that's really the beginning point. That's really where we start with God. So, you know, as a Christian, we go to God and we cast our cares on Him and we know we do wrong, and when we do wrong, we confess those to the Lord. That's one way to train our heart to be humble or to acknowledge our sin to one another. If we, you know, accidentally break something that belongs to somebody else instead of trying to hide it, we go to them and we say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, neighbor, I, I broke your lawnmower or whatever. I was 
out there target practice and I actually put a put an arrow in your in your radiator I'm sorry or whatever um, confessing our sins and acknowledging them to others to take wrong patiently if somebody does wrong to us you know not to get too upset about it maybe maybe I really needed to drive that car today but now there's an arrow in it well what am I going to do now well don't get upset about it maybe somebody will give you a ride maybe your neighbor will get, let you borrow his car <laughs> whatever I don't know where the arrow came from I just <laughs> uh, actively submit to authority good and the bad so you know Hey, if you was driving 46 and a 45 and that cop decided to pull you over, you know, I do that sometimes but it's because everybody else around me is doing 70 and a 45, but the guy chooses to pull me over. Well, take your lickings. Yeah, I was speeding. One mile an hour, I was doing it. Accept a lowly place. Now, we talked about, you know, a lowly estate last time. And that doesn't necessarily go along with humility if you live in a humble house or whatever. But a lowly place might be, you know, hey, uh, the church has, has needs of cleaning and stuff like that. And a lowly place is, hey, I volunteer to do the toilet bowl ministry in church. That was my first job in church. Did it for two years. And, you know, I was, I was happy to do it. Still happy to do it if I need to. But accepting that I'm not above that. I am willing to do whatever it takes to, play, you know, and I'm willing to plug myself into any slot. That's a good, that's a good place to be, to train ourselves. Purposely associate with people of lower state than you. You know, that is, that is true, but I really didn't like the way they worded that one. Because it kind of makes you feel like, I'm better than you, but I'm going to hang out with you because, you know, I'm supposed to. I just didn't like the way that was worded. But you get the idea. The idea is not to think of ourselves as, as being unwilling to hang out with anybody. I just like thinking of everybody as all equals and we're all children of God. And I don't like to think of it that way. But, uh, but I, 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 I won't associate with everybody. And uh, not being cliques, you know, sometimes that happens in churches. We tend to hang out with the same people over and over again. And I just want to not do that. And I hope that you guys will mingle amongst yourselves and mingle with everybody. So, uh, Choose to serve others. Be quick to forgive. Cultivate a grateful heart. Purpose to speak well of others. I kind of like that one, you know, to decide. I think some ministries call that... Uh, living on purpose or waking up with, with an intent to do good. I kind of like that whole line of thinking there. I didn't quite understand this last one. Treat pride as a condition that necessitates embracing the cross. That sounds like something somebody read out of a, out of a theological journal or something. But I think the idea is what they're saying is whatever problems we face, always take them to Jesus. Always Go to the Lord and cast our cares on Him is where that goes. So a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways to train ourselves to humble ourselves. And, and each of us, I'm sure, will have a personal situation that just begs to be a point of training. Um, I, I'm very blessed to work in a place where there, there hasn't been a lot of conflict as far as, you know, some places, some people might have employment where everybody is against them because you maybe you're the only believer there. I'm grateful to work at a job where I think pretty much everybody I work with is also a believer. So that's not an issue that I face. But that may be an issue that you face on your job. Everybody is coming down on you because, oh, what are you doing wearing that cross or that Christian t-shirt? You can't do that. I'll wear my Van Halen, but you can't wear your I Love Jesus t-shirt. Uh... You know, that may be the situation you face, and I'll face a different situation. But whatever, so you can identify probably those places in your life where you go, you know, I really am having a difficult time at my job or whatever. And you know what? I think this may be a, God is giving me a training opportunity. <laughs> and so we can identify for our own selves what maybe those training opportunities are. But take that and use it as an opportunity to humble yourself.
There's a lot that could be said there, but I'm, I'm, that's a lot you know that you can look at too on your own, and I, I think that's probably the right place to leave it there. To close up on this topic about God's people being humble, I wanted to look at John 13 and some verses here. This is talking about Jesus being with his disciples at the time of the Passover, near the Last Supper. And so, who would like to read this last one? It's, it, we'll break it up into two. Let's have two different readers. Now before the festival of Passover, Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet, Jesus answered. Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Okay, stop there. Washing of feet. Think about what is hospitality today. Somebody comes in, you know, it's a fancy party or whatever, you're the host. Somebody comes in, you're probably going to have somebody at the door to take their coat. And if they're wearing a hat, take their hat or whatever and take care of that and set it to the side. Now that's, that's, that's a little element of hospitality that you might expect today. Uh, something that's commonplace in our world today. Think back a hundred years or so ago, before, before we had automobiles that ran under their own power, if you were coming and uh, arriving at a place, you probably arrived either by walking there or you might have a horse and a buggy. And you arrive with your horse and buggy and, you know, uh, if you were self-served, you might have a hitching post there, but if, if they were extending hospitality in a, in a really kind way, they might go out and meet you and say, here, go in and warm yourself. I'll put the horses in the barn for you and I'll give them some hay and I'll, I'll take care of this. You go inside and just start to rest up and get ready for the festivities or whatever. Now that would be like a hundred years ago. Way back in the time of the, old, of, the, of the Gospels in the New Testament, we're talking 2,000 years ago, I uh, don't think there was much in the way of horses and buggies back in those days. Maybe you had donkeys and similar things, but more, more or less, most everybody that I read in the Old, Test, in the old Testament and in the, in, in the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, they basically walked wherever they went. Jesus walked everywhere. And the customary thing to do back in those days, if you're walking along, even if you had sandals or something, is you'd get dirt in your sandals. They didn't have paved roads, most of them. Romans started laying some roads, but it was mostly dirt roads. And so if you were out walking in this hot region of the world and you had nothing but your sandals on, when you come in, man, do you imagine the color of what your feet would be. They're going to be stained with, you know, let a kid go outside and play for a little while barefoot and they come in, their feet are black as coal, right? Even if it's just dirt or whatever. Well, everybody was walking around like that because that's what just, that was just the nature of things. That was what happened. Well, in those days, hospitality was when someone came in, you didn't, you didn't start enjoying their company or let them join the party or whatever until they had a time to freshen up and their feet get cleaned. So that way you didn't walk around the, the, the house in the dirty feet. It was just a courtesy thing that you always provided either the means for them to wash themselves or if you're really fancy, you wash their feet for them. And it was an element of courtesy in those days and hospitality. Jesus scolded the Pharisees once because he went to their house and they were very well to do, most of them, and he went in and he said, you did not even provide any means for me to wash my feet, but one of his disciples came in who had uh, a, a sin on her heart that she wanted to be forgiven for. She came in and wept and her tears washed his feet and she used her hair to wash his feet. 
He looked at the Pharisees and says, you didn't do anything about my feet, but this woman has cleaned my feet with her own tears and her own hair. Such a contrast. So the washing of feet was not something out of the ordinary in this day. But here Jesus is, and he is basically get the water out, and he goes around and he's washing the disciples' feet. Now they've been had they had a supper already. They've been here for some time, so in some ways they probably was confused a little bit. What is Jesus doing? But then Peter sensed that there was something here. It's like, hey, you're our master, and we're your disciples. You shouldn't be washing our feet. What's going on here? And so he starts raising a flag, and he says, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, you don't know what I'm doing yet. He said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you're not, you're not even going to be in this party anymore. You're not a disciple if you don't let me wash your feet. Peter's responsible. Shoot, Lord, give me a whole bath. I don't care. I'll do anything. That Peter was a, he was a real strange fellow. But he had a good heart. And so that's where, that's where we're at with this reading. Okay, who's, who's, who'd like to read that last bit there? And when he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set an example that you should also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than that one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus basically was telling them, I am showing you a lesson in humility. I am showing you that even though I am the Son of God, and even though I am your Master in this in this relationship where you're the disciples learning and hearing the words of God from me, and I am, he said, in effect, the, the leader of this of this group. He was teaching them that there was no reason why he should himself not be humble. And so he, the master, washed each of his disciples' feet demonstrating that even though he was in the higher ranking position in this relationship that they had, that he was not above washing their feet. And then he goes on and he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. That you should do as I have done. It was in about this same period of time in the, in the evening that he also did communion. And we, we have communion here at our church once a month on the first Sunday of the month. And he said, do this in remembrance of, of me. But you know, and so these things sometimes are thought of together, foot washing and communion. But it's really interesting. Churches all over this land do communion. But Jesus said, he, he didn't use a strong language with it. He, he just said, but yeah, as often as you do it, you know, whenever you get around to it, do this in remembrance of me, the communion. But in this part of the scripture, he says, you should do this. If you read other translations, it's even more forceful than that. You will wash one another's feet. He was letting the disciples know that this is an act of humility that as Christians we need to participate in and it, at different times we need to engage in that humility to wash one another's feet. Now, some of you might have experienced that in the past in other churches. Some of you may not have ever seen it before. I've been to uh, two different churches in my life that they had foot washing services. And a foot washing service... Um, I've seen it done different ways at different times and so on. But that is something that I want our church to do as well on, a, on, a, on an occasional basis. So maybe like twice a year or something like that. Since we are talking about humility now in the sermon series, this is something that I'd like for us to do uh, next week at the singing service. Our singing service is very informal. There's no sermon uh, it's a chance to give me a break from that and everybody to share. 
Um, and so next week at our singing service, after the, all the singing is done and, and we're at the end of the service, anyone who would like to participate in foot washing, we would like to do that next week. Um, so we'll do it at the end of the service, and that way anybody that chooses not to, not ready to do that or whatever, basically that you can go ahead and leave for the service. But we're going to do this next Sunday. If there's a few of us or all of us, it really doesn't matter. But what, uh, what we're going to do is have some tables up here in the front. I'm sorry, have some chairs up here in the front for whatever men is here. And the men will only wash the men's feet. And then at the other end of the room, we'll have table uh, chairs. And they'll be back to back so we're not looking at each other whatever. And it'll be separated so men only wash the men's feet, the ladies only wash the ladies' feet. And I wanted to do it on a singing Sunday, and that way if any of the kids wanted to participate, they could. And it's completely voluntary, and it'll be at the end of service, so you can even excuse yourself if you want to leave. But we'll have, um, we'll have something to catch water in, and everybody will have something. I, I don't want to... You know, mixed feet. We're living in the Corona days of Corona. So, in the first first foot washing service I ever saw, we had a basin of water that had about six inches of water, and everybody put their feet in that same basin of water. No, I'd rather not do that. Uh, and uh, so, what I want to do is basically have something everybody can put their bare feet in and catch water, and then we'll have a basin to pour it from. And if you want to rub some, that's fine. But that's that is something that I, I would like to start doing here at our church. It would be our first time to ever do that. We've not been able to do that since we have had this, you know, we've only had our own building here for a short period of time. Uh, but I would like to start doing that. Now, there's one thing about it is next week it's, there's going to be some cold weather moving in. I don't think, it, I think next Sunday it'll still be warm and the cold weather moving after that, but it might come early. So that might influence your decision. We'll have the heat turned up. And there's heat coming up from downstairs, so it shouldn't be an issue. But if you've never been in an old, they call them old-fashioned foot washing services. Has anybody ever been to one before? I see a few hands. So um, I, I've seen it. Like I said, I've been to two different churches that did them in the past. And the only reason that we do this is because Jesus said that this is something that is part of the Christian experience. Servants are not greater than their master, nor messengers greater than those who sent them. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. And so it's a blessing for anybody that wants to participate in that. <coughs> the first reaction usually when I talk to people about foot washing, and I've, and I've asked around to see how if anybody's experienced it, how they've done it in different places, and usually the first reaction is like, mm, I don't know if I want to do that or not. That's that battle going on in your mind, you know. That's the devil saying, oh, you don't want to do that. But it's an act of humility. And I will gladly wash anyone's feet because that's where I want to be with the Lord. I want my life to be pleasing to Him and I want to train myself to be humble. So if anyone would like to participate, that is fine. If you don't, that's fine and we won't. Well, like I said, we'll do it at the end of service. So you come to church next week, next Sunday, and if you would like to excuse yourself before we start, that would be fine. We'll have some kind of little break in between because obviously we'll have to do chairs and everything. Number five, to live a life of humility. Blank your mind to think of yourself in a humble manner. Train yourself. This, too, will find its way out and can be expressed in your actions. And the last one, number six, blank the feet of another person. Blank, blanking the feet of another person is the example that Jesus gave us to test us whether our hearts are in the right place to walk humbly before God. That's washing the feet, yes. God's people are humble. And this is this is a lifelong, this is a lifelong exercise. Our bodies do not want to be humble. Our hearts don't want to be there. Because that old nature of the old man is there. The mind wants to think bad thoughts. The body wants to do bad actions. And the heart wants to think too highly of itself. That's the struggle that we face with sin and with fallen man. 
So I hope you'll join me next Sunday with, with that foot wash. And that's, if you've never experienced it, it is something to experience. Um, but let's, uh, let's close and um, go to the Lord in prayer. And then if anybody has need for special prayer, we'll do that before we go. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Lord, we praise you and lift you up today, Lord. And as we lift you up, Lord, Father, we bow our heads low because we want to be humble before you. Lord, your people are humble. You hate pride and you lift up the humble. So, Father, we want to live and act according to the desire of your heart to not think of ourselves too highly, Lord, and to be willing to... Go and do the things that you have set before us as an example. Lord, uh, through this week, Lord, prepare us for the week to come. Lord, prepare our hearts. Lord, help us to uh, be like soft clay that can be molded, that we can be the work of your hands, the master potter, Lord, that we can be shaped into the form that you want us to be so that we can be better people, that we can be better parents and better children and better friends, Lord. Help us to grow and to learn in that way. But Lord, help us to grow in humility among, among, above all else, Lord, to be humble and walk humbly before you. Lord, we love you and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. So if anybody has a need for special prayer, we'll do that at this time. And, uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to share or say before we go today? Hey, you talking about the old-fashioned uh, foot washing. Yeah. Remember the old tent revivals from back in the day? I do. I do yeah. remember a big, being part of a big tent revival one time. In yeah. Aaron. My grandfather used to, used to have those. They had a they had the brush arbor, the camp meeting. Uh -huh. The tent revival. Tent revival. Yeah. I uh, I was part of a tent revival one time. The all the tent material was inside an old school bus. It didn't even run anymore. They just had it towed in, and yeah. we set up like a big three section. It was like a big circus tent, mm -hmm. and uh, got you know these little axles that are on train railroad cars, and hammer those in the ground and tie off the ropes and raise that tent up. And, what an experience that was. I do remember that. Never remember foot washing at a tent revival, but been in some of those too. Yeah. yeah. Then I had the old brush arbors where they would just build up tall things of a, a brush. Yeah. And basically all we had back then was just lanterns and campfires. That was very similar to that. The closest thing we've done to that is when we went baptizing down to the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anybody else got anything you'd like to share before we go? Don't forget, next Sunday is our singing service, so I hope everybody will bring some, something to share, a song, a poem, a, a testimony, something to share with the others. Uh, this is the first time you've been in a singing service, is that right? Yeah, so basically, uh, we don't have an assistant pastor right now, and Sheila thought it was a really good idea if I took a break once a, once a month, mm -hmm. so we, this is basically just a service where it's kind of like, think of like open mic night, where mm -hmm. anybody that wants to do something to praise the Lord, to use a talent, uh, or if there's something that inspires you, like I said, poetry, or whatever, we've had people read poems, or uh, talk about a, a, a past thing that was uh, a story about the Lord that was lifting him up. Anything that lifts up the Lord, um, we just invite everybody to come share it, and that's our last Sunday of the month, is the singing Sunday. We call it singing service, but you don't have to sing. You can do something else. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, all right. Anybody else like to say anything before we go? Well, praise the Lord. Let us uh, let us be dismissed. And uh, again, it's we're about 20 minutes before noon. So if you are interested in going to the uh, burial service for Randy's grandmother, we're basically meeting the funeral home that is addressed on the front of the bulletin and then be part of the caravan that goes to the to the grave site. So thank y'all for coming. We love y'all. God bless.